In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you. We bless your holy name for another wonderful day you have given each one of us. Lord, at this very moment, as you teach us your word, Spirit of God, take complete control of this class. Help us, Holy Spirit, to understand these hidden truths of your word. This entire chapter 23, which has been dedicated in the rebuke of Jesus to the Pharisees, to the scribes, to the religious leaders of his times. Help us, Lord, as we hear this gospel passage to look at ourselves just as Jesus rebuked those people. Help us, Lord, to realize that we too can also fall into the same trap, can fall into the same attitude. At this, holy, at this moment, Lord, Spirit of God, enlighten our hearts, our minds, our lips, our tongue. Lord, as I share the word, anoint me so that nothing that I speak will be of mine, only of you, Lord. Make this teaching absolutely easy. Give us understanding so that as we apply every truth that we learn each day, we can truly experience the life that you have promised us of victory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So my dear brothers and sisters, we have been reflecting on Matthew chapter 23. And this entire chapter, as I mentioned to you in the previous class, is a chapter which the writer St. Matthew has dedicated to the severe rebuke of Jesus for the Pharisees, for the scribes, to the religious leaders of his times. And you know, brothers and sisters, God loves sinners. God really loves sinners. He doesn't love the sin, but he loves the sinners so much that he's willing to go out and find the lost is willing to go and find those who sin so that he can bring them to the fold. But the one thing that God hates is hypocrisy. He doesn't like hypocrisy because hypocrisy puts up a false image. Hypocrisy puts a mask. Hypocrisy makes a person think that they are all good on the outside when inside the heart is not very good. The heart has not received him. The heart has been truly deceived. And you know, a person, brothers and sisters, like the Pharisees, who has got a double standard in their life, one for the public, one for the, for the, for the, for the, for the television, one for the, you know, for the focus of the world, and one which is a private life, is a life that God hates, and God absolutely cannot tolerate this sort of an attitude of hypocrisy. And that is why these Pharisees actually live the life of hypocrites. On the surface of things, although they were religious leaders, they were the people who were given the, the job of being custodians of the law. They were the ones who were told to share the good news. They were the ones who were to teach the people, actually went on to put loads and burdens on the people, but they themselves did nothing to help the people, nothing to you know, pick up their load and you know, help them to walk in their difficult moments. All that they did was they kept on people's backs and on their heads, heavy loads of religion and failed to be an example to the people by living that same authentic life. The Lord gave these Pharisees a severe rebuke only because he did not tolerate hypocrisy. Jesus does not tolerate people who act one on the outside, but have got a different view on the inside. And those who cannot come there in sincerity before the Lord, the Lord offers them the most severe rebuke. So today's gospel from Matthew chapter 23 verses 27 to 32 gives us Jesus's most severe rebuke of the Pharisees. So with this background, let us go to verses 27 and 28 together. Verses 27 to 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but inside 
They are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. So you also on the outside look righteous to others, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You know, my dear brothers and sisters, if you read these two verses, 27 and 28, you will realize that people spend a lot of money in trying to decorate the graves of those who have passed away. You know, it's more of a sentimental issue. You really want to go to the cemetery and, you know, decorate the graves. There are tombstones that are put and, you know, some of the remains of the dead are usually taken and put into those tombstones and every year or every 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 time and again people will go and visit the cemetery and visit those tombstones and you know say a prayer or probably probably put some flowers decorate it paint that tombstone and make it look so attractive and you know brothers and sisters even today in the secular world i don't know whether it happens even among us but even in the secular world people erect statues of people who have died and gone they erect statues, they erect great monuments of the dead men and women, and they make them so beautiful, they actually, you know, decorate them. They will spend, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars to maintain those structures. And many a times you will find that people who have dead and gone, people are still living their lives as though they have left some legacy or they have left something for us to remember. When we understand that people who have died from this world have finished their innings. They have finished their life. They are already gone to be with the Lord if they believed in Christ. And therefore, there is nothing that you can actually expect from them because their remains have only remained. There is only their bones. There are only their remains that are living on this earth. And we tend to take so much of care, so much of precautions, so much of money spent in up upgrading or even upkeeping those tombs of the dead. And what is inside those tombs? Inside the tombs is, is just dead bodies. They are only the bones of people. And you know, because of this fleshy behavior, because of this carnal behavior, we tend to go even to the cemetery and spend so much of time praying over the souls of the dead, praying over people who have already finished their innings on this earth. And you know, brothers and sisters, Jesus was comparing this same attitude, this same behavior to the attitude of hypocrites. You know, hypocrites are people who put up a false image on the outside. They actually put a mask and they present themselves before the public, they present themselves in before society, they present themselves even in the church as people who are holy by doing all sorts of act of holiness. But the Lord knows our hearts. The Lord, you just cannot hide anything from the creator. He's our creator. He knows us inside out. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when a person puts up a false image on the outside, but inside there is so much of jealousy, there is so much of envy. There is so much of self-centeredness. A person with such an attitude going to the Lord is absolutely a disgrace. Because when a person comes with such an attitude to the Lord, first and foremost, the Lord does not even hear such a person. The Lord doesn't want a person who comes there with his self-righteousness, thinking that he is better than God or God needs him in order to serve in his kingdom. Remember, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to acknowledge our sinfulness before a holy God. Unless we understand our inadequacies, unless we understand our deficiencies, unless we understand without this God, we are not complete. Then only we will come before this God, humbling ourselves, coming before him, seeking for his mercy, seeking for his grace, seeking for his help, seeking for his guidance. And the moment we begin to have such an attitude, an attitude of humility, that humility is the one that allows us to receive the very best of God. God always is looking at the heart. That's what he told Samuel the prophet who had come to anoint the, the sons of Jesse because the sons of Jesse, one of them was going to be the king. And in that first lineup, when Jesse lined up all his sons, David was not even present in that lineup. He was looking after the sheep. So when the Lord told Samuel, do not look at the outside of these people because they were handsome, they were tall, 
They were well built. They looked like men who could be really kings of Israel. But the Lord told Samuel, do not look at the outside. God looks at the heart and therefore I'm rejecting all these sons of Jesse because none of them is fit in order to be the king. And that's the time Samuel the prophet asked Jesse, he says, do you have any other son? And that's the time Jesse said, I have more, but he's not even worthy because he looks after sheep. But let us call him. And Samuel says, we will not sit to eat until this son of yours is brought into the lineup. And the moment he was brought in, the Lord told Samuel, anoint David as the king of Israel. You know, brothers and sisters, it is our humility. It is our humbleness. It is our, it is our nothingness that attracts the mercy of God, that attracts the grace of God, that attracts the favor of God, that attracts the very best of God. And if ever we have an attitude that we, because of our education, because of our righteousness, because of our status, because of our money, because of what we have, we can actually come before God on terms that we don't think we need God in our life. God absolutely rejects us. And that was the flaw of the Pharisees. They believed in their own righteousness. They fasted, they prayed, they gave their tithes. They did everything perfectly according to the law. But the truth is, their hearts did not love God. Their hearts did not love their neighbor. They were so self-centered. They just loved themselves. Everything they did was only about themselves. And you know, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit helps us today to discern how we can stay away from people like that, how we can stay away without having fellowship with people who actually live life of hypocrites. Hypocrisy is a disease which God can't cure himself. Listen to this very carefully. Hypocrisy is a disease that God cannot cure himself because God does not want to get involved in the life of hypocrites. When people behave like hypocrites, they will not be able to take fellowship in the fellowship of God. They will just be there physically present, but will never experience anything from the Lord because their self-righteousness has cut them off from God's fellowship. Now, let me give you two examples which give us a little idea what this whole hypocrisy, all this self-righteousness, or this attitude of hypocrites, which really puts off God and even it can put off people. Even when people act like hypocrites, it is visible. A life of a hypocrite is easily visible to society. God hates it. And even man, the people who interact with a hypocrite also hate. Let us go to Proverbs chapter 23, verses 6 to 8. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 6 to 8. Do not eat the bread of the stingy. Do not desire their delicacies. For like a hare in the throat, so are they. Eat and drink, they say to you, but they do not mean it. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and you will waste your pleasant words. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, the wisdom of Solomon? He says... Whenever you go to a stingy person and you basically are served by a stingy person, anything, anything, whether it's food or, you know, anything of their resources, whether it's their time, whether their talent or anything, you know what is going to happen? Because their heart is not right. It's only on the outside that they actually don't mean what they say from the heart. They just say it on the outside. You go and partake in their fellowship. What will happen? The word of God says that whatever they offer you, you will actually vomit out. You'll have a tummy upset. You will have something going wrong in your system because what they have offered you has not been offered with love. It's been offered with guile. It has been offered with envy. It has been offered with jealousy. It has been offered with all the poison that is inside of them. And therefore, brothers and sisters, even human beings, when they come in contact with hypocrisy, when they come in contact with insincere people, they will find 
that they will also experience that poison which is emitted out of such people. God hates hypocrites. God hates hypocrisy. And he cannot save a person who believes in his own righteousness unless that person actually humbles himself and comes before a holy God telling this God, God, I'm nothing without you, but with you, I can do all things. With you, I can even achieve what you have put me on this earth for. The purpose for which you have put me on this earth can only be fulfilled, my dear brothers and sisters, when we acknowledge God as God. We, there is only one God and we know that it's not us. There is only one God and that God is sitting up in the heaven. He has come on this earth. His name is Jesus. He has given us his spirit and his spirit is within us the day we believe in the son, Jesus Christ. And so brothers and sisters, when we are interacting with people who are hypocrites, we are interacting with hypocrisy as a sin. We are interacting with people who are insincere. We will find that nothing that these people do can ever bear fruit. People who interact with such people will also find that poison getting into them and they will also vomit everything that they have received from such a person. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. The Lord is also telling us even when you receive the treasures of the kingdom of God, when you receive the, you know, the revelation of God, don't be so quick to go and share it with anybody. The first one was you are being offered that. The second one is you have received it. Be careful to whom you are sharing it. Be careful to whom you are giving the treasures of the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 7 verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Can you imagine brothers and sisters what is holy? What is that which is holy? The Lord is saying, do not give to dogs and do not throw your pearls to the pigs. Pigs do not understand what is, what is, what are pearls. For them, they don't understand the value of pearls. A dog doesn't understand the word of God and a dog will never understand the things of God. A dog only understands how to eat a good bone, how to eat meat, how to eat something to fill its stomach. In the same way, when a person has got an attitude of insincerity, has got hypocrisy, don't go and feed them with God's word because that person will never accept God's word because they will never be able to take God into their life. A hypocrite, when you give a hypocrite the word of God, they will turn around just like a dog when you throw something at him, he will turn around and he will bite you. A, a pig, when you throw a pearl to it, just trample on those pearls because they don't understand the value. And therefore, a hypocrite, when he is given the word of God, can never accept it. On the contrary, he will trample the word of God. And therefore, we who have treasured the word of God, we who really believe in Jesus, we know who he is. We know he's the creator. We are cautioned. Don't go and just feed somebody with the word of God because you are excited with the word. Allow the Holy Spirit to help you discern whom you should feed the word of God. Remember, brothers and sisters, the Pharisees were hypocrites. Jesus came even for the hypocrites. He came for the Pharisees. But did the Pharisees accept him? No. They, on the contrary, every time he shared the word, they would find a reason to pinpoint where they could disqualify Jesus, where they could find some fault. And that is the attitude of hypocrites. They are so religious minded. They are so fixed with things, what they have learned, that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, not even the Holy Spirit who can come physically in a bodily form can ever change such people because they have decided that they want to be lost for all eternity. Remember, a hypocrite can never be saved. A hypocrite can never receive salvation because their God is themselves. They are righteous in their own standard. For them, it's not God's standard, but it is their own standard. They make their own standards in order to feel that they are right and the world is wrong. Even God is wrong for a, for a hypocrite. And that's exactly what the Lord says. When you have to share the word of God, when you have to give what is holy to somebody else, discern it. Ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, 
To whom should you want me to go? To whom do you want me to go and share the good news? To whom do you want me to go as the lost person who can listen to that word of God and be saved? Because brothers and sisters, many a times in our excitement, we would like to go and share the word of God. We all get excited when we hear the word of God. We got excited because of the miracles we have seen in our own life. And it is true. But please remember, not everyone is going to receive the word. Not everyone is going to melt under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Not everybody is going to find the word of God as sweet smelling offering. Not everyone is going to find that word of God tasting like honey in their mouth, just as the word of God says. But it is going to be a stumbling block for those who are going to be lost. And therefore, brothers and sisters, Jesus in this first verse says, hypocrisy is the greatest danger for anyone if he is going to seek God and enter the kingdom of God. Hypocrites can never be saved. Hypocrisy is taking us straight to hell. And it's only when we humble ourselves Come in our nothingness to God and tell God, Lord, without you, we are nothing. That's the time we can receive the very best of God. We can receive salvation as a free gift. Verses, the rebuke of Jesus, brothers and sisters, in this verse, verses um, 27 and 28, we see the rebuke of Jesus is extremely strong, is extremely strong. And it shows us God's hatred of hypocrisy and falsehood. When we fail to show integrity, when we sh fail to show what is inside of us on the outside of what we display on the outside is coming from our heart, which is filled with love, which is filled with the love of God, then only God can use us and make us usable in his kingdom. And those who are hypocrites, those who are really putting a mask and going around the world are actually agents of Satan because they are lying, they are deceitful, and as a result, just like that parable which Jesus taught, he said, on the day of judgment, the weeds will be separated from the wheat, and the weeds will be put into that fire which shall never be put out. The weeds will be burned. Many a times, brothers and sisters, many times people feel there are some people who live, you can see them, they are hypocrisy, you can see the life, you can see the fruit that they give, and yet this God who's so merciful will not destroy them. That is why the weeds and the wheat shall grow together till harvest time. But the day of harvest will come. The weeds will be plucked out. They'll be thrown into the fire which will burn for all eternity. And those weeds indicate none other than the hypocrites. None other than those who acted good on the outside, but had such poison inside of them, were agents of Satan, they were deceitful, they were liars, and what they did was only acted as spokes, only acted as impediments to the kingdom of God. And so brothers and sisters, just like the weeds will be separated on the day of Christ, in the same way, hypocrites will also be separated on the day of Christ when Jesus comes again, the weeds will be put into the fire that shall never burn away, that shall be burning for all eternity. And therefore it is a caution, it's a warning for us that we need to immediately come before the Lord, humble ourselves, take away all sense of self-righteousness within us, take away all those things that we have put into our life and made our own gods and allow God to be God in our life and receive the free gift of salvation. Verses 29 to 30. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding the blood of the prophets. Now to understand these two scriptures, brothers and sisters, from 29 to 30, I want to take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. I want you all to really reflect on this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Let us read that. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light 
of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, the word of God says that the God of this earth, the God of this earth is not the G-O-D, which is in capital G, but the small G, because the small G indicates the God of this earth, Satan. And you know, the word of God says, the God of this earth has blinded the eyes of unbelievers to prevent them from seeing the light of the gospel. So if the God of this earth has to prevent the unbelievers from seeing the light of the gospel, there could be only one reason for that. Why? Because of lack of understanding. Remember, brothers and sisters, when we do not understand God's word in the parable of the sower and the seed in Mark chapter 4, Jesus spoke about the four, seed, the, the, the four soils where the word of God was thrown. The seed was thrown by the farmer. It fell on the different soils. And there were four soils of which the least, with the soil which had the least, got the best maximum harvest. And this, the soil that where the word, fell, where the seed fell on the pathway, indicated the place where the, seed, where the, where the devil came and picked it up because when it fell on the pathway, the birds of the air came, picked up that bird, did not allow that, that seed to germinate. And as a result, that seed was not able to produce the, the fruit. In the same way, when we do not understand God's word, Satan immediately comes, takes away that word and does not help us to understand. And when we do not understand the word, we are not able to apply it in our day to day life. And that's exactly what happens. Many of us, even though we may attend a Bible class, many of us may attend several retreats, many of us may attend even the church services every day. But if we do not have understanding of the word, we do not understand what the Lord is trying to communicate with us. All that we are doing is going to be a pure waste of time and just going to be just a, just a, a fruit, fruit, fruitless exercise. Why? Because that understanding is going to help us to have that intimacy with Christ. That intimacy with Christ can only be developed when we have a practical working knowledge of that word. When we understand how that word works, then only we will be able to apply it in our day to day life. And brothers and sisters, one of the greatest dangers for our, for our in our Christian life is to have lack of understanding. When we get that understanding, Satan has lost his hold on us. The moment we begin to have the understanding of the word, now we are in a position to apply that word day to day in our life and walk victoriously because the word will always be faithful. God is always faithful to his word, but only when we understand the word and we start applying it in our day to day life. For example, we know that whenever we need prosperity, we always pray to the Lord to bless us. But when we understand biblical principles, we understand that it is only in giving that we receive. For example, in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, the Lord says, Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. Men shall pour into your bosom. For with the measure that you give is the measure with which you receive. Now the world will never teach us to give because the world will always say, take and then you shall have it. But biblically or in God's system, it's only in giving that we receive. And so many times people are praying, God bless me, God prosper me, God give me that abundance, God give me that job, God give me that thing, God give me this. And you know, brothers and sisters, God cannot bless a miser. God cannot bless someone who's only a taker, who's only one who's receiving. You know, there are two seas. One is the Red Sea and one is the Black Sea. In the Red Sea, the water flows in, in that water. There are fish, there are a lot of life taking place because that water is continuously flowing and it is now receiving life inside of that. But in the case of the Black Sea, that Black Sea does not give out anything. It's only receiving. And as a result, in that Black Sea, no birds, I mean, no fish can be there. There is no life in it. It's full of dense water, full of salt water that nothing can live in that. In the same way, a person 
who's never a giver, a person who doesn't give of themselves. They're only waiting to receive. They only pray to God and they say, Lord, give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. That's what they say to the Lord. They always even change their name, only coming to the Lord for request. All that they say, Lord, give me good health. Lord, bless my wife. God bless my children. God bless my family. God bless my job. Everything that they come to God is only for themselves, only to receive, but they are never givers. Such people, the Lord can just not bless us. And when we understand biblically, biblical scriptures, when we understand it, now when we follow those principles, then only we begin to see the harvest come in our life. And you know, brothers and sisters, these Pharisees, these scribes, these religious leaders were aware of the historical records of scriptures, who the true prophets of God were. They had studied the scriptures. They knew that Jesus was in fact the son of God. They knew that all the prophets that their, that their ancestors had killed were actually pointing to the Messiah. They were pointing to Jesus and what they had done. What these all these, these Pharisees, scribes and all this new generation had done. They had actually built tombs and maintained such beautiful monuments of all the old uh, prophets that the, their ancestors had killed. Yet, these same people were committing a far greater crime. They were committing a far greater sin than their fathers. Why? Because they were seeking to kill Jesus. They were seeking to kill the one that their own ancestors had killed who had prophesied that the Messiah would come and they were standing in front of the Messiah. They were standing in front of Jesus who had been prophesied. They had read the scriptures. They, the scriptures pointed out that the Messiah would come. And you know, brothers and sisters, these verses that we are reading in 29 and 30 are a classic example of spiritual blindness. They are a classical example when a person does not study God's word, doesn't understand God's word, how they become spiritually blind. And spiritual blindness, brothers and sisters, I'm going to say something to you which may probably shock each one of us. Spiritual blindness is hereditary. Spiritual blindness is hereditary, meaning it is coming from generations. Why? Because all of us, Every single person who is born on this earth is born spiritually blind and separated from God. But it is God who is constantly seeking us. It is God who is constantly waiting for us. He is constantly revealing himself to his people. Remember, brothers and sisters, every single person who lands on this planet earth, even though you may belong to a Christian family, even though you may belong to a family of saints, you will, if you belong to a family who have, who have, who have been, you know, having, having so many godly people who have lived in that family. If you are born on this planet earth, you are born spiritual dead. Every one of us, myself included, every single person is born spiritually dead. He's born absolutely cut off from God, lost with God. But what happens? This God is constantly revealing himself to his people and seeking to draw everybody to himself so that they will be taken out of their blindness. That's what we read in Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 20. Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 20. Let us read that. Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. So the word of God says 
that God has put this, you know, this inherent design into every human being. You may not necessarily be born in a Christian family. Every single person who's, who's born on this planet Earth, there is something put inside of them which actually is always wanting to seek God. There's wanting to seek that higher power which has created us. And you know, brothers and sisters, this is why it is inexcusable to continue in spiritual blindness. It is inexcusable. There is no excuse for anyone who walks on this earth to continue to walk in spiritual blindness. And these Pharisees, these scribes and these religious leaders were blind by choice. These spiritual blindness, these, blind, these leaders of that time, they were blind by choice. And if they did not respond to Jesus through the word that was being preached to them, they were in danger and they, they actually allowed themselves to be destined to hell. They themselves condemned themselves to hell. And if we today are taking the word of God for li so lightly, we are not focusing on the word of God. We are not focusing on the intimacy with Jesus. We are not you know, working to, to build our relationship with, the, with God through his living word. We also are in danger of drifting away and being damned for all eternity. We must understand, brothers and sisters, God has done his part. God sent his son Jesus to save us and he has canceled hell and opened heaven to us. But it will not happen automatically. It doesn't happen just because, you know, God saved us. God died for us that we are going to be saved. There is a response that we have to have. There is a response from each one of us. There is something that God has put inside of us to respond to his love. And if we fail to respond, but we instead of responding, we act righteously on our own, thinking that we are good enough for God. That's the time we, like the Pharisees, could condemn ourselves for all eternity. It's a wake up call, brothers and sisters. This gospel passage 23, Matthew 23, is a wake up call for every single person today. It's not only about the Pharisees. It's not only about the scribes. It's not only about those religious leaders. It is about every single person who walks on this earth, unless we understand that we need to have a relationship with God. We need to have the intimacy with God only through his word, through our relationship with Jesus. Now, what he has done for us now will flow into our lives. That salvation will change us from within and will allow us to be usable for the kingdom of God. Verse number 31. Thus you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. So here the word of God says, you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, if you understand who a witness is, a witness is one who has been present at the scene of action. Maybe there was a murder or there has been a, a burglary and somebody who has watched it becomes a witness. In the same way, those who are only witnesses can testify and these religious leaders were testifying against themselves. They were actually planning to kill Jesus after being fully aware that the prophets that their ancestors had killed had actually prophesied about the Messiah. They were standing before the Lord of Lords. They were standing before the king of kings. They were standing before the Messiah whom their ancestors had killed. The prophets who had prophesied about the, about the coming of the Messiah. And now when they started talking about planning to kill Jesus, trying to eliminate him, they themselves were testifying against themselves, condemning themselves for all eternity. And you know, brothers and sisters, these Pharisees, these scribes refused to believe in Jesus. And that was their biggest sin because when they failed to believe in Jesus, they condemned themselves for all eternity. The word of God says in John 3, 16 and 17, John 3, 16 and 17, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all those who believe in him will not perish, but may have eternal life. And then he says it was only through the son. Let us read both these verses, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. 
Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That the world would be saved through him. And when we understand, brothers and sisters, that each one of us even today can only be saved by believing in Jesus. What is the meaning of believing in Jesus? Believing in Jesus is not just a word that I say, yes, I believe in Jesus. I go to church. I pray. That's not believing in Jesus. Believing in Jesus simply means I'm responding to his word. I believe his word. And because I believe his word, I respond to the message of Jesus. Everything in my life becomes a response to the message of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, God has given us a lifetime. If we, he could just save us in our spirit and the next day he could take us to heaven, he would have done that. But the reason he won't do that is because this mind of us, this soul of us needs to be renewed constantly. It needs to study. It needs to be taught. It needs to be tamed just like a dog is tamed. This mind of us needs to be tamed in order to understand and obey the word of God. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we begin to understand that only by believing in Jesus, by renewing our mind with God's word, allowing our thinking to be in line with what God has put into our born again spirit. Now we can experience that life of God. We can experience that life of abundance. And when we begin to experience something, we can go and tell others. Can you imagine somebody going and preaching the word of God and actually living a life of, of, of sickness, living a life of poverty, living a life of problems, living a life of aches? Would that be a good witness to Christ? Can a person who's living a life of sickness with all sorts of disease stand on the pulpit and talk about a good God who has taken all our sickness? That would be such a poor witness for the kingdom of God. But a person who's experiencing the fullness of God, a person who's experienced that abundant life, a person who's experienced that peace and that joy, the person who's experiencing Christ in his life, can actually stand up there and be a witness to the kingdom of God. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is important for us to understand that when we believe the word of God, when we do the word of God every day of our life, that word of God has the ability to transform us within, has the ability to change us from inside because salvation doesn't happen from the outside in. It always happens from inside out. And therefore, when we receive the word of God, we change our thinking. We change the way we approach life and we change it, everything by believing the message of Jesus. Now, we ourselves are going to experience that fullness of life. We are going to experience that life of Christ. And now you and I can become witnesses of the gospel wherever we go. And this is why it is important for us to testify to the goodness of the Lord, to testify what the Lord has been doing in our life. Remember, brothers and sisters, every time we get an opportunity to testify what the Lord is doing, what he has done in our life, how we have taken his word and we have allowed that word to sink into our thinking, allow that word to percolate right into our system and allow that word of God to become, you know, part of our life where we are living that life of abundance so that we can share to the world what the Lord is doing, that's the time we are testifying to the goodness of the Lord. We are glorifying God for what he's doing in our life. Verse number 32. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors. Jesus is pronouncing judgment on these scribes, on these Pharisees, and on these um, religious leaders. Jesus is putting them in the same category of, the, of their ancestors who were actually born spiritually blind. Remember, brothers and sisters, it is true that spiritual blindness is hereditary. It is true that we enter this world absolutely dead in our spirits. But the good news is when we come to Christ, when we believe the good news, when we know that salvation comes only through Jesus and we start living our life, believing God's word, now that condemnation, that, 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 that being lost for all eternity is changed. 
hell is cancelled and heaven is open for us and the same is true for each one of us if we are able to accept christ we are able to reject the the lies of the enemy we are able to take the word of god and start living it then only we will not have the same fate as these scribes as these pharisees as this as these religious leaders of the time of jesus remember it's not our title it's not our position it's not who we are that decides it's to whom we belong to when we understand that we belong to christ and we as sons and daughters of the kingdom obey the word of god and allow the word of god to become our final authority that's the time we are going to experience the fullness of god we are going to experience that life of god and now we can be usable in his kingdom to bring glory and to bring so many souls into the fold under that one lord and under that one shepherd let us pray father in heaven we thank you and praise you for giving us the understanding of your word today this passage from matthew chapter 23 is a is a powerful chapter regarding the admonishment regarding the rebuke of those pharisees of the religious leaders during the time of jesus but Lord, as we read this word, as we read this chapter in, in, through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, we begin to realize how, Lord, we in our own way have been living life of hypocrites. We have been living double standards. We have been expecting so many things from you when you have already provided everything by finishing for us on the cross. Today, Lord, help us to get out of our self-righteousness. Help us to get that poison of envy, of jealousy, of, of everything which is of, the, of this world out of our system by believing your word and allowing us to receive a victorious life that Jesus has finished for us on the cross. Lord, for this understanding, for this great privilege for us to live this life that you have promised us and to be witnesses of the gospel to the ends of the earth, we thank you and we praise you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.